If you're a regular consumer of the popular science press, you've undoubtedly been inundated with the message that there is something radical taking place in evolutionary biology, that recent discoveries in genomics, molecular biology, and developmental biology are transforming how we understand evolution. You'll have heard that the standard evolutionary paradigm that focuses on selection acting on random variation in population Populations is becoming rapidly obsolete, soon to be replaced by a new, expanded theory of evolution. Often these critics of standard evolutionary theory lob their grievances at an amorphous entity variously called the modern synthesis, neo-Darwinism, the evolutionary synthesis, and sometimes simply standard evolutionary theory. In this video, we're going to critically examine the claim that evolutionary theory is a theory in crisis. We'll begin by clarifying the history of the development of the modern synthesis, including distinguishing evolutionary theory from the synthesis of the 30s and 40s. We'll discuss how changing narratives and focus within the field has led to confusion about underlying theory, which is agnostic to the perspectives of individual biologists. Finally, we'll address the persistent calls for a so-called extended synthesis, concluding that the extended synthesis represents neither an extension nor a synthesis, and that ultimately evolutionary theory, again distinct from the modern synthesis, is a robust and comprehensive framework in no need of radical transformation. So buckle up, let's talk about the development of the modern synthesis. So what was the modern synthesis? The modern synthesis was a period in the history of biological science between 1930 and 1950 in which many once disconnected fields of biology were unified into evolutionary theory. The need for such a synthesis was first proposed by the philosopher of science J. H. Woodger in his 1929 book Biological Principles, in which he lamented that biology, unlike physics, physics and chemistry was tainted by a kind of metaphysical thinking such as vitalism. The idea that life is distinct from non-life not simply by the emergent properties of chemicals, but by something fundamentally non-material. Further, biological research seemed to him to be little more than stamp collecting. Each field, systematics, paleontology, botany, cell biology, etc., all describing and collecting their own little stamps, independent of one another, without any principle, theory, or natural laws to sort of unite them. You can imagine the old way of doing biology by thinking of the natural historian, the intrepid traveler going to faraway lands and collecting and documenting what they saw, retelling their journey in a narrative fashion, like Humboldt's journals and Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle. These naturalists, upon returning home, home, labored endlessly under microscopes, dissecting and describing the many exotic species that they found. All of this was important research, but Woodger noticed it was strikingly different from anything in physics or chemistry, where universal laws and theorems were being derived, not merely to describe the world, but to make quantitative predictions about it. Nothing like that existed in biology at that time. All of that began to change in the 1910s when Darwin's theory of natural selection was unified with the recently rediscovered Mendelian laws of inheritance. This period was turbulent, full of animosities and controversies. If you want to know more, check out my video, A People's History of Darwinism, in the description below, in which I document the disputes between the Mendelians and the Darwinists. For our purposes, we need only recall that the competing schools of thought at this time each lent the tools necessary for unifying evolution with Mendelian inheritance. 
First, a mechanistic understanding of how inheritance worked. That is, inheritance was not blending or continuous, but was discrete, what they called particulate, with genes being physical units faithfully passed on each generation without any loss or blending of information. Second, the Darwinists provided the statistical tools needed to evaluate traits in both natural and laboratory populations. These included linear regression, chi-squared test, the concept of variance and covariance, and correlation coefficients. Thus, the beginning of evolutionary theory, the quantitative and predictive aspects of evolutionary biology, was founded during this period of the unification of Darwinian selection and Mendelian inheritance. Many contributed to this unification, but the major three were R.A. Fisher, J.B.S. Haldane, and Sewell Wright. What these three founders of evolutionary genetics did was provide a rigorous mathematical framework for understanding evolution, which they reframed from the naturalist concepts, which were focused on taxonomy and individual morphology, to changes in the heritable characteristics of populations. Thus, they stressed that individuals don't evolve, populations do. This is critically important. For evolution to occur, there must be variation among individuals, which emerges as the result of mutation. But this alone is not evolution. That mutation must then spread through the population. This spreading causes the entire population to change over time as the ancestral phenotype is replaced by a new one. Wright, Fisher, and Haldane uncovered the mechanisms responsible for this spread, which have become the processes or or forces of evolution, mutation, selection, genetic drift, and gene flow. In addition, recombination is an important source of generating novel combinations of genotypes and hence constantly supply selection with new variation. Theoretical population genetics hence move biology from a descriptive narrative field into a rigorous quantitative discipline with an array of mathematical models capable of making concrete predictions about the natural world, something that did not exist in biology prior. Furthermore, population genetics elevated evolution to the status of a unifying theory. Instead of focusing on the various idiosyncrasies of each organism, as natural historians did, it treated populations as ideal entities with universal properties that could be evaluated and applied to any organism. For example, if I know that there are two genotypes in a population, one which provides a fitness advantage over the other, but is recessive and at low frequency, frequency, I can make a prediction from this information alone how the advantageous allele should spread through the population. Furthermore, if I have an estimate on how big the population is and its mating structure, I can even make probability statements about how likely that allele is to be fixed at all. None of this relies on the specifics of the organism or the environment that it is in. Does it matter if it's a frog or a bird, a snail or a gnat? Indeed, the same underlying population genetic theory is used across the tree of life. It is this property of population genetics, which is the foundation of modern evolutionary theory, that makes it such a powerful and unifying force in biology. But population genetics is not the modern synthesis. Remember, the modern synthesis is specifically a historical period of unification of all biology, not merely genetics and Darwinian selection. What population genetics did was provide a rigorous mathematical framework from which all the other disconnected fields of biology could draw from. Since population genetics was mathematical, to many biologists it was abstract, and before it could be accepted it needed to be demonstrated to actually make predictions that could be observed in either the laboratory or in nature. In 1937, Theodosius Dobsansky published Genetics and the Origin of Species, which did just that. Meticulously researched and documented, Dobsansky demonstrated how the principles of population genetics could be applied to laboratory populations, mostly of the fruit fly Drosophila, as well as in natural populations of Drosophila. Dobzhansky was a collaborator of Sewell Wright, who brought with him his mathematical expertise, whereas Dobzhansky was a skilled field and laboratory biologist. Together, they convinced biologists that a genetical theory of evolution was possible, not merely abstractly in the mathematics of population genetics, but was explicable in real organisms as well. 
For many historians of science, genetics and the origin of species marks the beginning of the modern synthesis. In 1942, the systematist Ernst Mayer, trained as an ornithologist and classical naturalist, would publish Systematics and the Origin of Species, which attempted to link organismal biology, including speciation, with the evolutionary theory in the same way as Dubzhansky had for natural and laboratory populations. Mayer viewed evolutionary theory as lacking in the ideas of how discontinuities evolve. That is, the taxonomists saw all around them distinct bird species, beetles, ferns, etc., but the population geneticist only theorized about how a single population changed. To Mayer, evolution needed to also explain how populations split and became distinct. Drawing from the population genetics concept of a population as a single breeding unit, Mayer defined species as a population in which all the members were capable of interbreeding. With this definition in place, speciation becomes simply the accumulation of reproductive isolation between two discrete populations. Using population genetic intuition, he argued that gene flow would act to homogenize a population, and hence allopatric speciation, which a population is isolated geographically from one another and gene flow is effectively halted, should be the most common in nature. He was also skeptical of sympatric speciation, in which two populations occupy the same area but nevertheless diverge, due to gene flow swamping out differences over time. Notice that despite Mayer not using any mathematics in his books, he is pulling heavily from population genetic terminology and results. Wright had shown mathematically that only a single migrant per generation was enough to prevent extensive population differentiation, and this certainly influenced Mayer's thinking on speciation. An important point should be made here. While Mayer's thinking is intuitive and powerful, his ideas were not theories in the formal sense, like population genetics is. In many respects, Mayer was doing science in the same way the old naturalist had. He was trained as a naturalist after all. That is, he was relying on his extensive observations in nature and his reading of population genetic theory to make verbal hypotheses as to how speciation might occur. Thus, the modern synthesis is not a theory. It is, again, a historical period of unification between biological disciplines. Many population geneticists, most vocally J.B.S. Haldane, disagreed with many of Mayer's ideas, in particular the ones that were the least amenable to algebraic testing. For example, Mayer's ideas of genetic revolutions and co-adapted gene complexes but it still brought systematics into the fold of evolutionary biology. Other fields were to follow. The paleontologist G.G. Simpson would publish Mode and Tempo of Evolution in 1944, a groundbreaking work that argued that the facts of population genetics and so-called microevolution also explained broad-scale macroevolutionary patterns in the fossil record. Simpson's work has often been misunderstood by critics of the modern synthesis. Simpson not only argued for a gradualist view of evolution, as some claim, but also wrote extensively on patterns of rapid change in the fossil record. Indeed, he pulled heavily from Sewell Wright's idea of the adaptive landscape to explain these transitions between adaptive peaks, a population genetic concept applied to macro evolution. While most of the modern synthesis thus far focused on animals, G. Ledyard Stebbins would bring botany into the fold in 1950 in his book Variation and Evolution in Plants. Like Mayer and Simpson before him, he applied the principles of population genetics to understanding plant evolution and even stressed the importance of hybridization as a force of introducing novel traits into populations that selection could then favor, a remarkably modern idea for its time. The popularization of the modern synthesis, and where it gets its name, is from Julian Huxley, brother of the novelist Aldous Huxley, who wrote A Brave New World, and grandson of Darwin's bulldog, Thomas Henry Huxley. Julian published Evolution, the Modern Synthesis in 1942, which 
pooled together the studies from diverse fields of biology, all of which had been inspired by the evolutionary theories of population genetics. Much of the historiography of the modern synthesis, including the period known as the Eclipse of Darwinism during the early 1900s when the Mendelian school won the battle over the Darwinist, come from Julian Huxley. To summarize, the modern synthesis represents the synthesizing of many fields of biology into the umbrella of evolution. Systematics, paleontology, botany, genetics, etc. all found that evolutionary theory explained what they long sought to understand within their own fields. A few key principles arose from the modern synthesis, concepts that are still accepted today as cornerstones of evolutionary biology. These are, one, that adaptation is solely the result of natural selection. Two, that the effects of mutations are random with respect to the need of the organism. Three, that evolution is a population level process. And four, that accumulated mutations over time is the basis for evolutionary change. That is, evolution doesn't occur via leaps or saltation, but gradually. While biology was being unified, evolutionary theory continued to grow and mature. Many of the early papers of Wright, Fisher, and Haldane in the 1920s had numerous simplifying assumptions about the nature of population, such as their mating system, degrees of linkage between genes, their size, etc. But they dramatically expanded their models in subsequent decades. Wright and Fisher each derived expressions for dealing with linkage, epistasis, finite populations, various breeding systems, etc. They were joined by the next generation of population geneticists who took their theories even further and adapted them to nucleotides and proteins in the 1950s and 60s as the field of molecular biology was being founded. Remarkably, most of the theory that Wright, Fisher, and Haldane had derived, which was agnostic to the actual physical material of inheritance, remains intact even into the genomics age, where we still use many of their models today. Several historical narratives, whether by philosophers, biologists, or historians of science, diverge at this point. Some argue that the modern synthesis hardened in the 1950s and 60s, a period they believe represented a neglecting of most of the forces uh, originally discovered by theoretical genetics, such as mutation and genetic drift, in favor of an all-powerful natural selection. This concept is often called pan-selectionism, in which all features of organisms were described with reference to selection. Others have argued that the modern synthesis has been continually expanded, uh, conflating it, I think, with evolutionary theory itself. Still, others have taken the perspective that I have here that the modern synthesis was a period in history that describes how many, though not all, disciplines of biology found that they could understand their own respective fields by utilizing evolutionary theory. In this perspective, evolutionary theory is distinct from the synthesis and instead represents the various quantitative models and theorems of population and quantitative genetics, and increasingly models from evolutionary ecology, behavioral ecology, and phylogenetics. These differing perspectives help explain why some lambast the modern synthesis as too restrictive because it ignored their discipline. For example, molecular biology and genomics didn't exist in the 1940s and hence couldn't be synthesized into evolutionary theory at the same time as other fields. But these perspectives ignore the fact that as these fields were coming into their own, evolutionary theory readily was expanded to incorporate them. A prime example of this is in the field of molecular evolution, which is the application of population genetic theory to sequence evolution, the A, T, C's, and G's instead of alleles like big A and little a. As I said earlier, this was relatively seamless due to the fact that alleles in a population genetic framework could be nucleotides, protein allozymes, insertion variants, etc. The underlying theory is agnostic to the physical basis, which, again, is a sign of a pretty powerful theoretical framework. Another example is behavioral ecology, the field that studies the evolution of behaviors in an ecological context. In the 1960s, kin selection theory was proposed by Bill Hamilton, and Maynard Smith and George Price introduced game theory to evolutionary biology. 
each of which relied on the basic principles established 30 years prior in population genetics to understand why animals interact and compete in the ways they do. These ideas also precipitated the so-called gene-centric view of evolution, promoted by George Williams in the 1960s and later by Richard Dawkins, which argued that the gene is ultimately the target of selection. Is the gene-centric view then part of the modern synthesis? Many of the founders of the synthesis would disagree. Indeed, Ernst Mayer famously argued that the individual was the target of selection, not genes. This perspective formed his critique of mathematical genetics in the 1950s, which prompted J.B.S. Haldane to write a scathing response titled A Defense of Beanbag Genetics. This disagreement highlights that the modern synthesis was not a theory at all, as the individuals involved often disagreed on the finer points. Nevertheless, critics of the modern synthesis often state that it is gene-centric, despite this view not emerging until the 1960s, after the synthesis had already occurred. Again, if we view the modern synthesis as a continually evolving paradigm, then all subsequent work in evolutionary biology is a part of it. Stephen Jay Gould famously critiqued this notion by comparing it to Steve McQueen's The Blob that, quote, becomes more formless the more it consumes. This was also how the historian of science Betty Skumovitis described the historiography of the synthesis as a, quote, moving target. It's also useful to note that there is a bit of tension in the history of evolutionary biology between narrative and theory. The narrative component I'm defining as sort of the prevailing zeitgeist, often guided by a lack of data. This perhaps captures the hardening view of the modern synthesis, that widespread adaptationism became the default position for many biologists, not because there was abundant data, but rather because there wasn't enough to resolve the issue one way or the other. So in the UK, the Fisherian school of thought, which coalesced around the view of Fisher that chance events in evolution were relatively unimportant and adaptationism was rampant. However, there existed at the same time a competing school of thought, the Wrightian school, following Sewell Wright's ideas that chance events were very important in evolution, especially in shifting populations between adaptive peaks. These competing narratives might loosely be called hypotheses. Importantly, the underlying mathematical theory was the same for Wright and Fisher. What differed was whether the selective intensities were small enough that chance could play a role, or whether population sizes were small enough for chance to be important. These are empirical questions that couldn't be answered until more data was gathered. When, in the 1960s, molecular biology blossomed and polymorphism data was collected for many natural populations, it became clear that there were far too much variation than could be explained by selection. This conclusion was arrived at based on previous theoretical results. Hence, again, mathematical evolutionary theory permitted us to understand the data even as it emerged. This abundance of variation led Moto Kimura to propose the neutral theory of molecular evolution, which posited a central role of genetic drift in evolution. Kimura's theory relied on mathematical models derived decades before, some by him, and represented not a novel mathematical formulation of evolution, but rather a shift in focus, a changing zeitgeist, if you will, from adaptationism to neutralism. Note these competing narratives don't change the underlying population genetic theory. The math is the same regardless. What changes is the outcome of the model. The models themselves rely on empirical measures. We want to know the mutation rate, the population size, selective intensity, etc. Once we have all these measures, the models provide predictions about how populations will evolve. The narratives we tell before we have these empirical measures are just that, narratives. Hence, while our narratives can be constantly shifted based on empirical evidence, the mathematical theory itself is unchanging, though it 
can be expanded to account for additional phenomenon such as linkage, inbreeding, etc., as mentioned previously. Now that we have an understanding of the history and development of the modern synthesis, we can move to discussing the many critics of it. To do so, we must clarify what is being critiqued, as I've tried to argue, the synthesis was a period of history, and hence it's rather silly to claim we need to extend a historical period. What critics are actually critiquing might be called standard evolutionary theory or contemporary evolutionary theory. The first fervent critic of the synthesis came from the developmental biologist Conrad Waddington, who contended that development and epigenetics were concepts being ignored by the synthesizers. Waddington had previously collaborated with Haldane, but would eventually label him as a neo-Darwinist, a term used derogatorily. The term neo-Darwinism dates back to George Romanus in 1895, long before the modern synthesis or even the formation of theoretical population genetics. Romanus used this term to refer to Darwinian selection with Wiseman's concept of heredity, which rejected Lamarckian inheritance that Darwin's pangenesis theory supported. Wiseman proposed that there was a barrier between the soma and the germline, what became known as the Wiseman barrier, and hence the material stably inherited from one generation to the next was immune to environmental changes to the soma. He showed this in his famous experiment in which he cut off the tails of nearly a hundred mice and then had them breed, finding that each generation the offspring had fully formed tails. Hence, the environmental impact on somatic cells, the loss of their tail, had no impact on the germline, opposite what Darwin and Lamarck thought about inheritance. Thus, the term neo-Darwinism is technically inappropriate to refer to the synthesis or even to population geneticists like Haldane. But in the decades since Waddington's usage, the phrase has come to be used synonymously with the modern synthesis by both supporters and detractors alike. Regardless, Waddington contended that epigenetics, that is, non-genetic inheritance of traits that can be influenced by the environment, such as gene silencing via methylation, as well as maternal effects and social learning, challenged the synthetic focus on genes. However, as mentioned previously, population genetic theory is agnostic to the actual material of inheritance. Epigenetic variation can be called epi-alleles, and hence, so long as they are passed on faithfully, they can be modeled exactly like true genetic variants. Furthermore, in quantitative genetics, the price equation readily accommodates all forms of non-genetic inheritance and has even been used to study social evolution. See my video, Evolution's Fundamental Theorem, for an explainer of this history and the derivation of the price equation for more details. There is also widespread skepticism over the importance of non-genetic inheritance in evolution. While the phenomenon is known to exist, and several studies have shown that epigenetic variation can be passed on through multiple generations, it's unclear how often this actually directs evolution. Studies going back to the early 1900s cast doubt on this. Several studies, most famously by Wilhelm Johansson in 1903, inbred laboratory lines to make them breed pure, that is, they had no genetic variation. These lines were then exposed to several selective pressures to see if they could change. Since epigenetic variation emerges from environmental variants instead of genetic variants, if epigenetics were capable of driving evolution, these inbred lines should still have been able to respond to selection. Yet they couldn't. Inbred lines have been consistently proven to be evolutionary dead ends. These results are ubiquitous. In natural populations, highly inbred species tend to be the most susceptible to extinction because of their inability to adapt to novel environments due to lacking genetic variation. Likely a prime driver of this distinction between genetic and epigenetic variation relative to its importance in evolution is the instability of epigenetic inheritance relative to genetic. For sustained evolutionary change to occur, the heritable material must be robust to slight environmental fluctuations, which epigenetics typically is not. 
Hence, non-genetic inheritance is no challenge to either the modern synthesis or contemporary evolutionary biology. It is readily accommodated in existing quantitative genetic models, and there is experimental evidence that it is likely not a major source of adaptive variation. Another critic of the modern synthesis, who likewise adopted Waddington's neo-Darwinism insult, was the paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould. Over several decades, starting in the 1970s, Gould attacked the synthesis as one in desperate need of radical revision, and he saw his own ideas on evolutionary theory as providing such an overhaul. In case you're unaware, Gould proposed punctuated equilibrium theory, which posited that most evolutionary change was cladogenetic instead of anagenetic, which means that the typical pattern of evolution in populations is stasis, and that populations change when they split. In this way, he defined evolution not as the change in the heritable characteristics of populations, but the change in the heritable characteristics as populations diverged. This branching point was taken to be punctuated or rapid, followed once again by stasis. To Gould, the modern synthesis, and subsequently contemporary evolutionary theory, was hindered by a devotion to gradualism, which is more of a concept of Darwin than a major tenet of current evolutionary theory, which he rejected due to the patterns in the fossil record. Furthermore, he argued that the synthesis viewed phenotypic change as isotropic. Organisms were effectively plastic and could be modeled in any direction via mutation and subsequent selection. Instead, he argued that developmental bias directed what kind of evolution could occur, and this bias, first noted by Waddington, was being ignored. Each of these claims are false. Uh, many population geneticists attacked Gould's ideas in the 1980s, demonstrating he had a remarkable knowledge gap of the theoretical literature and evolutionary genetics. First, several theorists showed that in the Wrightian view of evolution, with its emphasis on adaptive landscapes and shift between peaks of fitness, standard evolutionary theory actually predicted rapid change followed by stasis. This is because populations should rarely spend time in valleys of fitness, with directional selection rapidly pulling them to peaks, followed by subsequent stabilizing selection, maintaining the population on that peak. On the timescale of the geological record, the shifts between peaks would seem almost instantaneous. G.G. Simpson, the paleontologist who contributed to the synthesis, had argued much the same thing with the incorporation of Wright's landscape metaphor in his own work. Next is that developmental bias was ignored by the synthesizers. In fact, the term allometry, which refers to the correlation of growth between different body parts, such as height and limb size, was coined by Julian Huxley. Indeed, Darwin himself wrote about correlated growth patterns. Furthermore, quantitative genetic theory, developed by Russell Landy starting in the 1970s, readily accommodates correlational selection. In Landy's model, the products of selection can be viewed as the product of a variance-covariance matrix between traits and a vector of selection coefficients. In this way, if traits have a non-negative covariance, they are correlated, and shifts in one influence changes in the other. The Landy model has been a central feature of quantitative genetics for 40 years. To try and be charitable to Gould and Waddington, uh, one interpretation of their critique is that their beef was with narratives instead of theory. That is, the dominant narrative in paleontology at the time was gradualism, despite the fact that the underlying theory of rapid change and stasis had existed in population genetics since the 1930s. But this is perhaps too charitable, as Gould consistently called for an overhaul of the very structure of evolutionary theory, not merely the stories we tell about it. Building from this discussion of developmental bias, some of the most fervent critics of contemporary evolutionary biology are developmental biologists from the field of evolutionary development, or evo-devo. In the popular press, this field has been promoted by the biologist Sean Carroll in his 2005 book, Endless Forms Most Beautiful. Not only is this book a promotion of Evo Devo, but it attacks modern evolutionary theory as well, both from a scientific and non-scientific perspective. He writes, quote, Since the modern synthesis, most expositions of the evolutionary process have focused on microevolutionary mechanisms. Millions of biology students have been taught the view from population genetics that 
Evolution is change in gene frequencies. Isn't that an inspiring theme? This view forces the explanation towards mathematics and abstract descriptions of genes and away from butterflies and zebras. The evolution of form is the main drama of life story, both as found in the fossil record and in the diversity of living species. So let's teach that story. Instead of change in gene frequencies, let's try evolution of form is change in development. The population geneticist Michael Lynch, in response, wrote, quote, Evolutionary biology is not a storytelling exercise, and the goal of population genetics is not to be inspiring, but to be explanatory. Furthermore, any explication of an evolutionary process must recognize that variation initially emerges in a single individual, irrespective of if that variation is in a single gene, a regulatory network, or a whole genome duplication. And then that variant must spread through the population. How does Carroll's definition deal with this? In many respects, Evo Devo is a return to the descriptive science of the old naturalists. These switches in the network causes X and Y to develop in this place, which guides the formation of this or that body plan. While mechanistic descriptions of development are useful, they don't constitute theory, nor do they tell us anything about how and why these mechanisms exist. Ultimately, the change in development occurred via mutation and subsequently spread through the population via drift or selection, exactly as described by contemporary evolutionary theory. If Evo Devo supporters contend that evolutionary theory is missing some fundamental process, we'd all love to know what process they're proposing is absent. As Lynch wrote in his 2007 book, The Origins of Genome Architecture, quote, no principle of population genetics has been overturned by any observation in molecular, cellular, or developmental biology, nor has any novel mechanism of evolution been revealed by such fields. Thus far, we've dealt with critiques of the synthesis in the form of epigenetics or non-genetic inheritance, punctuated equilibrium, and developmental bias in Evo Devo, and shown that none of these proposed issues pose any serious problem for standard evolutionary theory. Many supporters of the so-called extended evolutionary synthesis also contend that standard evolutionary theory ignores what they call niche construction and plasticity. We're going to deal with each of these collectively by relying on the philosopher of science Elliot Sober's distinction between source laws, consequence laws, and evolutionary outcomes. This framework will also help clarify the place of non-genetic inheritance in evolutionary biology. First, we have source laws. These are the sources of the selective environment that include the external environment, such as climate, competitors, predation, parasitism, etc., and the internal environment, which are all the phenotypic traits that compose an organism. These sources are then funneled through consequence laws. These are the forces that act upon the sources and are the fundamental causes of evolution discovered by theoretical population genetics, namely selection, mutation, drift, recombination, and gene flow. From these, we then get evolutionary outcomes, which are the collections of phenotypic traits such as body size, plumage coloration, habitat selection, mating strategies, etc. Some of these outcomes also include feedback mechanisms that will subsequently influence the source laws of the next generation. An example is niche construction. Imagine a mutation that emerges that permits an organism to alter its environment in such a way that increases its fitness. This phenotypic trait is part of the internal selection environment, i.e. a source law that is then promoted by selection, a consequence law, and becomes an evolutionary outcome. This population can now modify its environment. But since the environment is itself part of the source laws, niche construction as an evolutionary outcome serves as a feedback on the external selection environment. But notice something crucial. Despite this feedback, niche construction does not 
influence consequence laws. That is, the actual evolutionary forces remain the same. Thus, while niche construction, as well as plasticity, which serves the exact same role, but instead of modifying the external selective environment, it modifies the internal one, plays a role in the formation of variation that selection can act upon, but it does not replace or add to the forces of evolution themselves. In this way, it is simply another variable to consider as we're modeling how consequence laws of evolution are expected to shape evolutionary outcomes. This is what Lynch was referring to. While we have constantly learned new things about source laws from diverse fields such as development, cell and molecular biology, ecology, etc., as well as discovered new evolutionary outcomes in the form of behaviors, novel proteins, or regulatory networks, foraging strategies, the consequence laws are nevertheless unchanging. Nothing has been added to them since the 1920s. Population genetic theory is remarkably robust for this very reason, that in spite of the deluge of new discoveries in biology, the same basic mechanisms are at play. We can expand our models to incorporate new evolutionary outcomes or new source laws, but in the end, they are always funneled through the same consequence laws. So what is the extended synthesis actually hoping to do? If the mechanisms are unchanging, what needs to be extended? First, the supporters of EES actually don't believe in extending the modern synthesis. To them, they believe we need a radical refocusing of evolutionary theory to consider their laundry list of complaints. As noted by this critique of EES, quote, the arguments reveal that the incorporation of evolutionary processes, research areas, and philosophical views does not imply a mere expansion, but rather a transformation of the previous interpretive framework. The EES proposes new ways to think about evolution, which involve substantial changes in concepts, processes, and notions of causality. Furthermore, EES is not a synthesis, but rather a promotion of pluralism. In many respects, it is a call to return to the old naturalist way of doing evolutionary science, where each field approaches problems under their own paradigm. Indeed, one of the supporters of the EES, Kevin Lawland, has made remarkably contradictory statements in this regard. As an example, quote, we believe that a plurality of perspectives in science encourages development of alternative hypotheses and stimulates empirical work. The EES is now a credible framework inspiring useful work by bringing diverse researchers under one theoretical roof. It's curious that Lawland argues both for a plurality of perspectives while also claiming to bring researchers under one roof. A pluralism implies a lack of synthesis. Again, the historical development of the modern synthesis was unifying disciplines, not in the promotion of pluralism. Pluralism is what reigned prior to the synthesis. In my perspective, the success of the extended synthesis has been a lesson in science journalism and hype. Many popular YouTubers have adopted the language of the EES, including claiming that things like niche construction, epigenetics, plasticity, etc. represent novel mechanisms of evolution as opposed to merely outcomes of the evolutionary process that, while capable of influencing the selective environment, are not themselves consequence laws. By adopting this language, we confuse what evolution actually is and the forces behind it, leading to thinking that there are potentially dozens of undiscovered forces of evolution. Nothing could be further from the truth. But the EES proponents have promoted their views far and wide, especially in the popular press, and this has created the false impression that their views are mainstream. They are not. The EES movement is still in the fringes of evolutionary biology and, I predict, will remain there. However, some of their terminology has undoubtedly made a lasting impact on the public discussion, much the same way as Gould's incessant promotion of his own theory of punctuated equilibrium has granted it much more staying power than it deserves. While the EES challenge is relatively benign, apart from causing a bit of public confusion, 
Others have promoted even more radical views of evolution and have coalesced into what they call the third way of evolution. This view, led by physiologist Dennis Noble and geneticist James Shapiro, argues that contemporary evolutionary theory is in dire disrepair, must be utterly rejected and replaced by something wholly different. Their views are often pseudoscientific, uh, almost vitalistic, arguing that organisms are agents of their own evolution. Shapiro, for example, has argued that mutations, such as those caused by transposable elements, are purposeful and directed by the cell itself in a process he calls natural genetic engineering. Noble has supported a revival of Lamarck, that evolution is directed by changes in the environment that directly changes the organism and influences future evolution, making a much stronger claim for epigenetics than even the most ardent EESer. These views, in my opinion, uh, deserve ridicule. Uh, and any member of the public that hears a scientist use words like agency and directed evolution should be immediately skeptical. These concepts represent ideas that were debunked 80 years ago. The third way gets its name from its perceived position between standard evolutionary theory and creationism. Indeed, proponents of the third way adopt many talking points from creationism, or so-called intelligent design, such as natural genetic engineering. As might be expected, creationists have also seized on these critiques of standard evolutionary theory to proclaim evolution a theory in crisis. Many creationists adopt the language of the third way, or is it the other way around, particularly the critique of the gene-centric view of nature and reductionism. Often, when they talk about neo-Darwinists, that's what they mean, gene-centric. But as we've already stated, this view is not even a part of the modern synthesis, as it didn't arise until almost 20 years later. Dennis Noble is the editor-in-chief of the journal Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology, and in recent years, this journal has published several ridiculous articles, including creationist drivel, demonstrating just how allied creationism and the third way of evolution really are. One such paper, by a medical doctor and an engineer, is titled Neo-Darwinism Must Mutate to Survive. The paper repeats decades-old talking points of creationists that the evolution of complex molecules is exceedingly unlikely to occur by random chance. They give some string of amino acids and ask, what is the probability that this string emerged by chance alone? So, if the string is 100 amino acids long and there are 20 possible amino acids, then the chance is 1 out of 100 raised to the 20th, which is 1 e to the negative 40. Virtually impossible, right? Right? Of course, this is nonsense. Evolution is not trying to achieve any particular amino acid sequence. This is a kind of hindsight evolutionary thinking, prescribing teleology to evolution. It's not surprising that creationists would apply goals to nature, but it represents a failure of understanding standard evolutionary theory. The emergence of any gene or trait is due to a combination of chance, via mutation, historical contingency, which mutations happen to emerge, and selection and drift, which manage to spread through the population. Some mutations will emerge, and some will be fixed. Which ones those are, aren't predetermined. If a population doesn't get the ones that it needs to survive, it goes extinct. And this has been the fate of most life on the planet. These are not serious challenges to either the modern synthesis or to evolutionary theory, but they serve to highlight how lowbrow the third way movement is that they are willing to publish creationist nonsense just to add to their own attacks on standard evolutionary biology. Don't be fooled by the cons. To recap, the modern synthesis was a historical period in the history of evolutionary biology that represented the synthesizing of previously disconnected fields all unified by evolution. The modern synthesis is itself distinct from evolutionary theory, which is rooted in quantitative and population genetics and is a formal mathematical framework for modeling evolution. 
The major contentions of the modern synthesis are that natural selection is the sole driver of adaptation, that mutational effects are random with respect to a population's need for them, that evolution is a process of populations, not individuals, and that evolution proceeds by the accumulation of mutations over time, not in giant leaps or saltations. Unlike the synthesis, evolutionary theory has continued to grow and incorporate even more fields, including genomics, ecology, and development, and is much broader in scope than many critics believe. Finally, proponents of an extended evolutionary synthesis failed to propose any new mechanisms of evolution. With each of their focal topics, epigenetics, niche construction, plasticity, development, etc., all being readily incorporated into standard theory. Indeed, most of these ideas were discussed by the synthesizers themselves, if not Darwin himself. My purpose in this video is, again, not to argue that evolutionary biology is a static field and that nothing new is being discovered. Rather, it is a defense of what I believe is the most powerful and profound theory in all of science. It's remarkable that a handful of forces of nature are capable of explaining the incredible diversity of life we see around us. This is not to say that that diversity shouldn't be studied, but rather that we have a rigorous framework for helping us understand how that diversity emerged. In many respects, Dubsansky's famous maxim that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution is the motto of the modern synthesis. Only in the light of evolution could biology be unified. But in this video, I hope to have also argued for Michael Lynch's restatement of this maxim, that nothing in evolution makes sense except in light of population genetics. That fundamentally, evolution is a process of populations, and its causes are explicable from the mathematics of population genetics. Thank you for being here. The sources for this video are linked below, but I want to give special reference here to Betty Skomotovitz's excellent book, Unifying Biology, from which a great deal of historiography of the modern synthesis was drawn. In addition, I relied heavily on the Swedish evolutionary biologist Eric Svensson's chapter, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, in the book, Evolutionary Biology, Contemporary and Historical Reflections on Core Theory. The historiography of the modern synthesis is contentious, and you will undoubtedly hear or have heard other versions of it, so I highly encourage you to read through the citations I've shared in the description to see a range of perspectives on this topic. If you have any questions or disagreements, please feel free to share them in the comments below. Thank you so much for being here, and I'll catch you next time.